Hey everybody, welcome back. We're wrapping up the first half of the book of Luke, session 13. Uh, don't worry, next week we start our new quarter, but we're going to continue on in our journey through the book of Luke. So even though it's the wrap up of this quarter, it's actually just the halfway point for us, all right? But uh, make sure you have your Bible, make sure you have something to write with, something to write on. Uh, pause the video, go grab that, come back, we'll dive right in. All right, so when have, or how have people that you've noticed or seen, how do they identify themselves as Christians? How do they identify themselves as Christians? Um, maybe you just need to jot down some notes as you think about it, but a lot of people wear a cross around their neck, maybe cross earrings. Uh, a lot of people, um, I mean, I, when I was in high school, we had t-shirts that we would wear all the time, and our youth group had t-shirts we'd wear, and I would almost rotate a Christian shirt every day of the week and just rotate that through for high school. And that's, that's all I really wore. But, uh, what about bumper stickers, social media postings, business name and logos that maybe have, uh, the ichthus or that fish symbol or a cross on it, you know, as you see going down with billboards, uh, up and down the road. Uh, maybe even people get things tattooed on them nowadays, right? Scripture on it or the word of God or images of, of Christianity on them as well. Um, that's probably how some people in our culture identify themselves. But while some people make an effort to identify themselves as Christians, others would rather follow Jesus from a distance. And uh, as we look at this, for example, Nicodemus would rather come to him in the middle of the night with no one watching. Uh, they may want to fit in with a specific group, so they keep silent. Maybe they're worried about the ramifications of publicly declaring themselves for uh, having faith in Jesus, uh, wondering what family, friends, and co-workers might say. Jesus' death on the cross was a public event, and he caused his followers to live a public life for him. So why might a person hesitate to identify as a follower of Jesus? Why would a person hesitate to identify as a follower of Jesus? Think on that, jot down some notes, come back, and we'll we'll jump into our first text. You know, um, uh, I know, I know. Th going through Bible st uh, studies, we all uh, mentioned Nigeria several times on trips. Very eye-opening experience about a third-world country and how they live. Um, my first time I went to Nigeria was a vision trip to see, kind of pick a people group for us to minister to. My second time I went was uh, we had hired a pastor to go out into the culture, and there was. Um, about 12 people that were ready to be baptized, uh, that, that they, they believed animism. They weren't Islamic where we were. They were animists. Uh, they believed in their, you know, praying to their uh, forefathers uh, who were in heaven, kind of a tribal, traditional uh, religion. But then they became believers in Christ, and they needed to be baptized. So we go to baptize, and, and we start baptizing. And when it was over with, uh, you know, I was baptizing them in the creek that they had, and it was over with, someone mentioned, said, did you see that one lady? said no I didn't see her said she kept getting farther and farther to the back of the line and then she started getting farther and farther away from the crowd and then when it was getting down toward the end she just started walking away and I said well why would she do that it turns out she was married to an Islamic husband and she knew that if she got baptized she had no home to go to she knew because the community was watching they would have known if she got baptized and declared publicly for the Lord, she would have lost her whole life. So the question is, did she have a genuine decision or not? I don't. That's between her and God, right? Uh, she didn't make it public. Uh, she didn't declare herself publicly for that. But what you see is that following Christ is a public event, and we shouldn't hide it, and we can't hide it. Nicodemus even eventually comes out as as helping with Jesus' burial. Uh, helps and assists in that publicly. So, what, so what we see is that following Christ shouldn't be hidden in our life. It should be something that overflows out of our life everywhere we go. So, why might a person hesitate to identify as a follower of Jesus? I mean, for us, it could be a shunning here and there, but in other parts of the world, it could mean imprisonment. It could mean death. Um, it could mean losing everything. Your 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 spouse. Your children your family and um, that's just uh, the way it is around the world and we just don't realize that in this American culture that we live in so as we look at Luke 9 
verse 18 through 20, Jesus, uh, uh, we talked about him at the Pharisee's house last week. Since then, he had sent the disciples out. And when the disciples came back and he was ministering to them, he fed 5,000. Then they went away just to pray and rest. And we're picking up in Luke 9, verse 18. And we're going to read verse 18 through 20. And listen for responses to Jesus, his question about his identity, okay? So, verse 18. While he was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others that one of the ancient prophets has come back. But you, he asked them, who, you, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Or in other translations, uh, the Christ, right? God, the Christ, the Christ of, of God. And so when we look at this, Jesus was not really interested in what the crowds thought about. Him. Now, now that being said, who, who do they look to, right? What were the answers from the crowd? Do you think Jesus really cared about their response of what does the crowd and the multitude think about who he is? No, but he was starting the conversation. So he said, hey, who do they think that I am? Elijah, John the Baptist, another prophet that's come forward. Maybe maybe Moses, maybe, uh, uh, you know, like uh, um, Isaiah has come back. But he gets down to the heart of the matter. Because it doesn't matter what other people say of who he is. He cared about what his disciples thought. So by him using the word you in this, which is a plural you, he asked the whole disciples sitting around the campfire or around, around this time, he says, but you, who do you say that I am? By doing that, he says, I expect a personal answer. I don't care about their opinions. I care about your answer at this point. So when he says this, and Peter, leader of the disciple, just quickly, God's Messiah. I mean, we've left everything, followed you. From everything that we've seen, everything that we've heard you teach, everything we've seen you do, the only answer that I have for you is that you are the Messiah. And, and, and that's the whole reason why we've left everything to follow you, because we believe in who you are and for what we've seen. Now, at this point, you've got to understand, it's limited knowledge. He hadn't died on the cross. They don't quite understand what the Messiah is, but they've put everything they got into following Jesus. They put all their eggs in this one basket as they follow. And when they believed what they believed about him would directly influence their response to his next statement of following him. Okay? So this is basically a litmus test that Jesus has. He's he's going through his ministry. We, he's, they've already seen a lot. And now he sits back and he says, Hey, you've seen everything going on. You've heard the rumors of what other people are saying. But what do you really believe about all this? What do you really think about this? So, how do the answers given by the disciples compare to how people view Jesus today? Basically, what do people today say about Jesus? Think about that. If you're watching this with someone or if you're teaching this lesson, brainstorm a little bit. Just write down some notes, have a conversation with them, come back, we'll go to our next section. All right, so once Jesus established that his disciples knew who he was and what he had come to do, he instructed them what to do with this awareness. So in verse 21 through 22, we're going to, as I read that, listen for Jesus' warnings and ponder why he gave this caution. Verse 21, but he strictly warned and instructed them not to tell this to, to no one, to tell this to no one, saying, it's, it is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and be raised the third day. Now, this is the first of five times that Luke records of Jesus telling his disciples what's going to take place in the future. This is one of the five times that Luke's going to mention this. So this is new information to the disciples, okay? He strictly warns them, and this carries this, a command. Basically, don't tell anybody what, I, what, what Peter just declared. Don't tell this to anybody. If the disciples started going out and saying, hey, we said he was the Messiah. He didn't deny it. He agrees with us that he's the Messiah. And now he starts feeding the ears of those that think he may be John the Baptist or Elijah or all these other people. Then, then the multitude, the group, or as I like to refer to them, the mob of people may take measures that would hinder the completion of his mission. 
because they don't understand the way the disciples understand. But even the disciples don't understand what Jesus knows. They're not grasping the fact. So even when they sit here and say, you know, he's going to be killed and resurrected. They don't get that. They don't understand exactly what he's talking about. Like, you know, even Peter's like, can't be talking this way. Jesus, you can't talk about things like this. Sure, we're going to be by your side. We're going to take care of you. They don't get it either all the way because they haven't seen it. They haven't lived it. Um, Jesus mentioned uh, several times the way that he would be killed in Luke. But the disciples had difficulty grasping that fact. And after all, they left everything to follow him. So they don't want to hear that he's going to be killed and then come back. They don't want to be killed and then he'll be raised back up because they left everything. And they know this is a dead end street in their mind because when people die, they tend to stay dead, even not as much around Jesus. But if I'm Peter, if I'm one of the disciples and they're saying this guy's going to be killed, then I can only follow him for a short amount of time. Then I got to figure out what to do with my life after this because they don't grasp that haven't grasped what the Messiah truly is. So Jesus wasn't trying to hide his true identity. He simply knew that not everyone was ready to hear and respond to the truth. So the Jewish leaders define Jesus through their own filter. What filters do people use today that give them an unclear understanding of who Jesus is? How do they use their filters and, 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 and come up with their own interpretation of who Jesus is? Think about that. Talk about that. Uh, write it down, and then we'll go carry on. I think a lot of times we look we look through the eyes of Jesus, uh, or we look through our own eyes, and we do filters. I know when we talk about other religions like Islamics, they agree that Jesus is a great teacher, that he's a good teacher. They just don't believe he was the Messiah. They believe in another prophet to come. They believe Jesus is even a prophet, but there's another prophet to come of of. Muhammad, and then another. If you're Baha'i, there's the prophet of Baha'i that came after Muhammad. So they just believe it's a series of God's chosen people. They don't believe it was the Son of God that came as the Messiah of the world. So I think a lot of times we think of Jesus as a good teacher, as a good person, a good moral person. That yeah, if you go along with those morals, you go along with those teachings, you can live up to it. But we don't. The world around us doesn't elevate him higher than Confucius or higher than Buddha or higher than Mohammed. They just leave it all on a level playing field because they don't want to offend or because they understand that if Jesus is more than what they give him credit for, then they've got to do something with that in their life. So by keeping him down on this level, keeping him more human than divine, right? Keeping him on this level as just a good moral teacher, a good prophet, then I don't have to respond to him the way that he's asking me to respond. So as we look at this, Jesus tells his disciples that he would suffer, but he wanted them to realize that suffering wasn't just reserved for the Messiah. So our last verses for today is verse 23 through 27, and, and look for Jesus' specific comments about following him. Verse 23, Then he said to them all, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and that, that of the Father and the holy angels. Truly I tell you, there are some, some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. So, so as we look at this, he has a conditional statement that he starts off with. If anyone wants to take up and follow me. So you have a choice. But if you do, here are the conditions to follow me. Now, what are the three steps that he puts in here for us to follow? What are the three conditions? Deny himself, surrender, submit, fall under his authority. Or as we would say now, after the crucifixion and resurrection, is is. Make him your Savior and Lord, as in submit, understand that only he can save you. Deny yourself. Uh, take up your cross daily, which means this is a life-changing event. Every day you're going to take up your cross. Every day it's going to be a struggle. Every day you die to yourself because that's what the cross is. It's an instrument of death. So every day when it says take up your cross, you're putting the cross on your back knowing that you're dying to yourself to follow Christ. And then thirdly, follow me. Die to yourself and follow me. Don't worry about the things of this world. Follow me. 
The same exact call that he issues out for numerous disciples as we see through the Gospels. But it's also the first command that he gives or the first statement that he makes toward uh, Peter. Peter, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. And then what? At the end, at the book of John when he's leaving, he says, it doesn't matter about anyone else around you, Peter, you follow me. The command's the same at the beginning of your walk as it is with the end of your walk. Deny yourself, take up your cross daily, follow me. Have faith, understand you got to die to yourself and trust me in what we're doing. People aren't going to like that, but be obedient and follow me. Um, so as we look through this, this idea uh, of someone who pursues personal goals instead of Christ, such a person will lose everything. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will save it. Right. If you're if you're looking out for yourself and you're trying to gather up as much as you can, not denying yourself, not taking up your cross, not following Christ. If you're trying to live for this world and for the right now, then you will end up losing everything. But if you lose everything now and follow him, you will gain everything. So uh, reading a book, getting ready for class, a chapter started focusing on what we get to take to heaven with us. You know, because we always talk about what we can't take to heaven, and that's the earthly things. But but one of it was you get to take your relationships to heaven. The people you know here, you're going to know them there. You get to take, ultimately, and this is the great best part, you get to take Jesus with you. Your sanctification continues on. You, you in Christ forever. And man, what a reward that is. And our, so we get to take our relationship with Christ, but also our relationship with other people with us. So... What does it benefit if someone gains a whole world but forfeits or loses or forfeits himself? Whoever's ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when it comes to the glory. Not saying you lose salvation if you're saved, but the reward's not, not as big as it should be. So, but verse 27 here, truly, which when you see the word truly, I always like put this, trust me. I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of heaven. Very next in the in the scripture coming up is a transfiguration. So you have Peter, James, and John who see the kingdom of God very soon after this. Others see it when upon their death. Others will see it periodically. Uh, you know, you talk about the apostles. They saw the resurrected Savior. And then they were just waiting for the life to come. They see the kingdom of God being fulfilled eventually for all eternity whenever we die or whenever he comes back but peter james and john get to see this real quick after this they get to see a glimpse of heaven and the kingdom of god at the mount of transfiguration so uh just a little tidbit of that as we move on so what does it look like for a person to deny himself and take up his or her cross and follow jesus what does it look like in today uh but also what does it look like but what are some obstacles that a person might need to overcome to identify with Jesus. What are some obstacles that have come? So what does it look like for you to take up your cross and follow daily? But what are obstacles that other people, and maybe you have as well, that it's hard for you to declare Jesus every day, identify with Jesus on a regular basis? It's hard for those that don't know Christ to come and be a part of Christ. Think about that. Talk about it. Discuss it. We'll come back and wrap up. So when I think about people that uh, have obstacles for coming to know Christ, I've seen people, I just, I want to live now, but don't worry, I'll turn to Christ later. Uh, I was talking about a friend, a friend of mine that did that in high school. I shared Christ with him and he said, you know what? I think I'm just going to live and have a little bit of fun now, but when I get older, I'll make a decision for Christ. Well, what took place is, good news is he has made a decision for Christ. He is following Christ. But that was after 20 years of addiction and alcoholism that's ruined his family and, and ruined his marriage and even his child that he is trying to restore a relationship with. But what we see is what would have happened if he made that decision that day versus waiting? Do you think he, you know, would he go back and made a different decision? But because of that, because of that obstacle in his life of, I just want to live and have a little more fun before I make the decision, 20 years of his life was gone, wasted because he didn't make a decision for Christ. What are other obstacles that we have? I mean, there's some people that this family, this pressure of family, I want to accept Christ, but my family's of another religion. And if I accept Christ, 
I lose my family. Now, that's not in an Islamic world. That's here in our own neighborhoods. That's here in our culture as well. I've heard that numerous times. Uh, I even had a youth that was called into ministry, but his parents said, no, you're going to go and get a real job, make money, and live a good life. And, and I'm like, if God calls you, God calls you. Now, with that being said, he decided not to become a minister. He thought leaving his family was too too important. So, so one, there's a judgment that's going to happen for him in his life, but also on the parents. And these were people that were in church every week, by the way. And so when I look at that, what I see is, is where his life was afterwards. And if you're not going to God, then you're going to be going away from God. So, so what I see in his life is, is he said he was called to ministry. His parents said no. So he went the route of his parents. So he just ran away from God. And, and you can see that marked in his life where he did that. So it's a struggle. Even in our own culture, obstacles are going to come in, come in our way. Some people can't get over the simplicity of it, right? Of just saying, all I got to do is, is invite Christ in my life. Well, that's just too simple. What else do I need to do? And that's an obstacle that comes in people's lives. So, so as we wrap up today, where do you see the kingdom of God working around you? But also, where do you see the strongholds that we need to be praying for softening of hearts, for the Holy Spirit to penetrate in there, for us, uh, the opportunity to share Christ so people can come to know Jesus in a saving way. And that's what we're going to close in prayers. I want you to lift up people that you know that need Christ, uh, communities that need Christ, and people that God has laid upon your heart uh, to either get right with God, get back right with God, or to, to follow God for the first time. All right? So I'm going to close this in prayer, but you jot those names down and have an extended prayer time. Lift those names up as a group as well and uh, be praying over them for this week. All right. Dear God, I do thank you for today. I thank you for Jesus, our Messiah, who's come. And Father, just ask us to deny ourselves and follow him and uh, take up our cross daily. And I pray and ask, Father, that we do that regularly, daily, moment by moment in our life, because it is so worth it at the end. And let us see the value of it in this life and in the life to come. But Father, for those that have obstacles in their way, those that uh, have hindrances for coming to know you, for those that have misinterpretations of who your son Jesus is, we pray and ask for the Spirit to soften their heart, for your Holy Spirit to come in and awaken their soul so they can come to know Jesus in a saving way. I pray and ask, Father, for those names that we're lifting up, that the Spirit is working mightily in their life, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you just work in their life so they can come to know Jesus. And uh, even if that means we need to share the gospel with them, or if someone else needs to share the gospel with them, put the right people in their path at all times. In your name we pray and ask it. Amen. Thank you. We'll catch you next week. Bye.